Okay, we are good okay. to go. Nancy. We're good. Okay, uh, Katie, thank you so much for getting the recording started. Um, and I just want to share with everybody, people have been so happy that we've been able to record the sessions because they were asking for this for a very long time. Um, so thank you who come to our sessions because you're the ones that make them alive and ask us questions and that we're able to have an exchange with each other. So thank you so much for being here. And the big announcement tonight is we are moving into our 12th year of Northwest Indiana Green Drinks. So I just want to thank all of our um, faithful and new um, followers. And um, I think we should, oh, Mary, thank you for the, um, for the confetti down there. I think we should all give ourselves a round of applause just because this is um, such a monumental occasion. Um, very rarely do green drinks um, have this length of existence. So that really says a lot about our region, about the um, people who live in our region, and also about your interest in all things green. Um, so anyhow, you're always welcome to bring your beverages um, to your computer as long as you don't spill them on your computer. And also, um, you can munch on your dinner or whatever. Um, we're we're a easy, laid back going event. So anyhow, just welcome and a sincere thanks from the bottom of my heart. And I know that Kathy Sippel, who um, started this all in Valparaiso, Indiana would be um, singing her praises and her appreciation also if she were able to be here. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, M, I am not going to forget about housekeeping <laughs> since I was reminded about this before we started. And um, M will just go over a few details to make this evening run smoothly. M, you are on mute. You know, thank you, Nancy. Um, Thank you everybody for coming tonight to Green Drinks. Just a couple of housekeeping announcements we always share. Um, welcome to all of those watching both on Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, everyone will be muted during the presentation, but please feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook and we'll answer them at the time, um, at the end of the presentation. We are all being recorded. Um, and then after our presentation, the recordings will live on our Save the Dunes Facebook page and YouTube channel. Um, so you can watch both this one again and all the other previous green drinks recordings that are in our archive. So thank you all. And I'll pass it over to Katie. Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, okay. So Harshini, can we dial up our presentation and I will get us started. So thank you very much um, for your interest in learning more about Save the Dunes. That is the topic for tonight, um, why the dunes still need saving. So we are going to be um, giving a bit of history on our organization as well as kind of what we're up to um, in more current time. So I am Katie. I am the program director at Save the Dunes. I've been with the organization for about three and a half years. And it is my pleasure to kick us off this evening, um, to share a little bit about, again, the, the history of Save the Dunes, because that's a very great story. Also, how our work has evolved over the years and how we carry out our mission today through our programming. And who better to talk about our programs than our program team? So, um, I am going to start us off by sharing, again, the history, some of that background information, and then we'll talk more about our current work, so what we've been up to over the past year and the unique role that we play in the conservation community within our program focus areas. And so each of us on the program team will talk about the area that we focus on, so I will share about our conservation work. Um, then I'll turn it over to Harshini Ratnayaka, our advocacy coordinator, who will cover our advocacy work. And then bringing us home will be Emery Seen, our community engagement coordinator, who will talk about our community engagement work and the ways that you can get involved with Save the Dunes. And then, of course, we'll have time for questions at the end. So please drop those in the, the comments or the chat section as you think of them. So this historic overview that I'm about to give you is going to be fairly brief because we have a lot to talk about today. 
Um, but the history of the movement to save the dunes is absolutely fascinating, and I would highly encourage you to dig into it and learn more. We have a couple of past green drinks where we share a lot more detail on the history. And so if you head to the Save the Dunes YouTube channel, you can see the recordings as M mentioned, of all of our past green drinks reporting recordings. And I'd recommend checking out October 2022 um, presentation by Susan Mihalo or the January 2023 presentation with our executive director, Betsy Mayer. They both um, shared a, a bit more detail about history. Or we have an event coming up on uh, February 28th that M will talk more about later, um, where you can, can dive into some history. So all that being said, Let's jump into it. Um, now, Save the Dunes was founded in 1952, but its origins go back to the turn of the century. So at that time, we had a group of folks out of Chicago called the Prairie Club who were making regular visits to the dunes to enjoy the beauty of the area. And for some members like Henry Chandler Coles, the, the dunes would serve as a, a natural laboratory, if you will, to uncover the mysteries of modern ecology. So this group became the earliest dunes advocates. And because they were spending so much time in the dunes, they were also witnessing firsthand a lot of development along the shoreline in a relatively short period of time. So just to give you a few examples, the Standard Oil Whiting Refinery, which is now BP Whiting Refinery, was founded in 1989. Sand mining at the Hoosier Slide in Michigan City began in 1890 and continued through 1920 until all the sand was gone. Um, and that's now where the Nipsco Michigan City Generating Station is located. The Inland Steel Indiana Harbor Steel Mill in East Chicago was completed in 1902, and that's now the Cleveland Cliffs Indiana Harbor facility, and Bethlehem Steel in Gary was completed in 1908, which is now U.S. Steel Gary Works, or at least that's what it is for now. Um, so the Prairie Club and other organizations that evolved out of this desire to preserve the dunes that remained decided they needed to take action, and they wanted to create a national park. And things were going pretty well for a while. In 1916, the National Park Service was first established, and there was support for the Indiana Dunes to be the very first national park in the country to be known as Sand Dunes National Park. And they were at the point where they were trying to figure out how to get Congress to pay for the land acquisition. Um, so things were, you know, progressing, moving along. But then in 1917, the United States entered into World War I. So of course that shifted spending priorities completely to national defense and there was no money to buy sand dunes. And pretty much any hopes of protecting the dunes at the federal level were squashed at that point. They kept trying for a little while, but to no avail. So the dunes advocates shifted their focus on acquiring state protections instead. Now this was not an easy feat by any means, but they were eventually successful. And the Indiana Dunes State Park was authorized in 1923 and open to the public in 1926. So this is why we have both a state park and a national park in the Indiana Dunes. The state park was one of the first big successes in preserving the dunes, and it wouldn't be for another 40 years where we would see that national park established. So after the success of the state park, the movement or the need, the desire to save the dunes got a little bit quiet for a while. Um, but of course, progress never stops and development pressures peaked again in the late 1940s. So the state of Indiana really wanted to build a deep water port. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers did several studies over the years and continually came back saying that Indiana doesn't need another port. We already have several ports. We do not need another port. But in 1949, the Corps released a report which finally advocated in favor for a deep water port at Burns Ditch, which is in Burns Harbor. So the state of Indiana said, yes, very great news. They're going to get what they want. But the dunes advocates said, oh, no. Burns Ditch was right in the middle of the central dunes, which were the most pristine dunes that remained. So that brings us to the 1950s when a woman named Dorothy Buell happens to see a flyer for a meeting to talk about saving the Indiana Dunes. And she had just come back from a vacation to White Sands National Park in New Mexico. And she thought if 
the government can save these dunes, why can't they protect the Indiana dunes? Our dunes are clearly so much better, right? Uh, so this flyer that she saw in this meeting just came at the perfect time. She attended the meeting and she decided she wanted to take action. So in June, of 1952, Dorothy invited 21 women to her home in Ogden Dunes to take up this cause, thus forming the Save the Dunes Council. Now, their original goal was to save the Central Dunes specifically by adding them to the existing state park. And they were working hard and had some early successes. For example, they purchased a portion of Coles Bog in 1953. But they were trying really hard to stay out of politics and instead worked on changing the hearts and minds of the public. Um, now, in 1956, Bethlehem Steel began, began buying land in the central dunes and also the efforts to create the port at Burns Ditch were moving forward. So Dorothy was advised that if they wanted to make something happen, they needed to get involved in politics. Unfortunately, the congressional leadership in Indiana had zero interest in preserving the dunes. Um, they wanted quite the opposite, in fact. So in 1957, Dorothy approached Illinois Senator Paul Douglas and asked if he would help them. And thank goodness he agreed and quickly began introducing legislation to protect a portion of the central dunes within the protection of a national park. Um, which was, of course, in direct opposition to the creation of the port. So now here's where I'm going to skip over a lot of detail, because the end product was that in 1966, the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore was finally established. But everything that happened between 1957 and 1966 could honestly be made into a movie. Like there's drama, there's scheming, the Kennedys are involved. It's like has Oscar written all over it. But in the end, we got our National Lakeshore, which is really great news, uh, right? Well, yes and no. Um, the decision to create the National Lakeshore was part of a compromise, which also authorized uh, the creation of the Port of Indiana. And in addition, if you recall that Bethlehem Steel was purchasing properties in the Central Dunes, um, well, in 1963, they began bulldozing those properties, and in 1964, they began construction on their new steel facility in Burns Harbor, which was truly heartbreaking for the Save the Dunes Council members to witness because all they wanted to do was save the Central Dunes, and um, even though they were successful in saving some of the Indiana Dunes, the vast majority of the Central Dunes were destroyed. However, I am certain that without the efforts of the Save the Dunes Council, all of the remaining dunes would have been developed. So it really is an incredible thing that they accomplished, and we owe them so very much. Um, so since its establishment in 1966, um, the Save the Dunes Council worked towards expanding the boundary of the National Lakeshore and adding acreage. And they successfully lobbied for expansion bills in 1976, 1980, 1986, and 1992, which brings us to the 15,000-ish acres that we have protected today. And then, of course, in or I'm sorry, in 2019, we had the name change, so we went from a national lakeshore to now officially being a national park. And I like to think back to the Prairie Club and those early dunes advocates that first came up with this idea of saving the dunes by creating a national park. Um, and it took nearly 100 years of one torchbearer passing the flame forward to the next, but we finally achieved that longstanding goal of having a national park. So that's all very exciting. So now I wanna bring us um, to a more current time frame. If you are familiar with our organization, then you may know that our full name is Save the Dunes Conservation Fund. So how exactly did we go from Save the Dunes Council to Conservation Fund? Well, in the 90s, the Save the Dunes Council wanted to do more dedicated long-term programming to carry on their tradition of protection and restoration in the Indiana Dunes. But at that time, lobbying laws were a little bit vague, and they were interested in pursuing federal grants to fund some of the program work. If you're familiar with grants, then you may know that federal funding and lobbying do not mix. And so just to keep things above board, since the council was carrying out lobbying activities, a complementary 501c3 nonprofit organization called Save the Dunes Conservation Fund was formed in 1994. 
And for roughly 16 years, the two organizations both carried out their work simultaneously. Um, it confused a lot of people because <laughs> now there were basically two versions of Save the Dunes, but they both had their role for a time. But by um, 2010, the lobbying laws had been clarified and Save the Dunes Council was well under the limit of what a nonprofit can legally do with lobbying. So the two separate organizations just were no longer necessary. As of January 2010, Save the Dunes Conservation Fund merged the operations of the Save the Dunes Council into its fold. So they chose the Save the Dunes Conservation Fund so they could retain that 501c3 nonprofit status, which is very important for both donors and grants. So today we are Save the Dunes Conservation Fund, but there is a part of us that will always carry forth the passion and advocacy of the council. Um, now, since the Conservation Fund was established, that focus on programming and long-term projects really stuck. The makeup of our staffing and the projects we undertake have ebbed and flowed over the years as our leadership has changed and enacted their vision on how we carry out our mission, which, if you don't know, is to protect and advocate for the Indiana Dunes, Lake Michigan, and the surrounding natural areas for the health and vitality of the environment and the people who live, work, and recreate in Northwest Indiana. And we deliver on this mission through our program work in advocacy, conservation, and community engagement. So our current structure is to have a dedicated staff member working on the projects within each of our three focus areas. So I lead our conservation work, Harshini heads up our advocacy work, and M leads our community engagement work. Um, this divide and conquer approach is a newer setup for us, and it's been working really well, actually. Um, a lot of our work tends to be behind the scenes and out of the public eye, which is why we love these opportunities to share with you all what we are up to. Um, and we always do our best to prioritize impactful projects that utilize the skills of our team and align with our strategic plan. But we're a relatively small group. Our full staff is made up of six brilliant women who work very hard every day to make a difference. Um, and we cannot be everything to everyone, but we are really proud about all that we were able to achieve last year and so excited about the projects we have on the docket for 2024. So we are going to watch a video that gives the highlights of our work from 2023. Um, and then after that, we'll jump into sharing some insights into the methods and motivations behind our work today. So we are going to switch some share screen things real quick, because of course the video is on my computer. Here we go. Okay, everybody see that? Awesome. Okay, please enjoy. 2023 was a groundbreaking year for Save the Dunes in so many different ways. From kickstarting land stewardship on our properties to defending the public trust, ramping up our volunteer programs, and actually breaking ground on Barker House renovations, this year was eventful to say the least. Let's look back at some of our most memorable highlights from 2023. This year, we welcomed two new staff members to our team. Lisa Scheller joined us in May as our development manager, and M. Racine came on in June as our community engagement coordinator. We are a powerful team and spend a lot of time together outside enjoying the Indiana Dunes and at the office working together to save them. We hosted our anniversary open house on June 21st to celebrate 71 years of saving the dunes. This event was the kickoff of our efforts to raise funds to renovate our headquarters, the historic Barker House. After generous support from several foundations and donors, we were thrilled to officially break ground on renovations of the front porch this November. In September, we hosted our annual fall fundraiser, the Monarch Music Fest, 
where we successfully met our fundraising goal of $12,000 and were joined by friends, family, and Save the Dunes supporters for an afternoon of music and food on the beautiful grounds of the Brewery Lodge right here in Michigan City. We also ramped up our volunteer efforts in 2023. Collaborating with the National Park, we organized employee volunteer work days for two of our mission-level corporate partners, Subaru and Nipsco. We also held several volunteer days right here at Barker House to clean up the grounds and work on our new prairie pollinator garden. Our dedicated volunteers who help steward our Stockwell Woods property in Long Beach joined us on site to prep the property for tree thinning and invasive species removal earlier this spring. The mission of Save the Dunes is realized through our work in advocacy, conservation, and community engagement. Across sectors, we advocate for our natural areas by identifying opportunities to influence decision-making and public policy. Through advocacy, change feels within reach. We were back in person in Washington, D.C. for Great Lakes Day this spring. Our team of volunteer advocates lobbied our Indiana congressional leadership to support programs and budget allocations that are vital to the health and vitality of the Great Lakes, like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. In the summer, we brought forth an appeal of a DNR permit for failing to evaluate the serious threats a proposed revetment wall would have to one of our precious remaining Indiana beaches. We collaborated with partners to work towards stronger state wetland protections, and we continued our work of creating a culture of pollution prevention in Northwest Indiana by convening partners, commenting on permits, and building relationships with both regulatory agencies and shoreline industries to improve communication. Through conservation, Save the Dunes aims to protect and restore critical lands and waters that make up the dune ecosystems through meaningful conservation projects that transcend jurisdictional boundaries. In 2023, our work in conservation spurred many partner meetings and opportunities for collaboration. We worked with the National Park and the Northwest Indiana Paddling Association to clear log jams from nine miles of river trail on the east branch of the Little Calumet River. We also helped organize a summit and paddle event for the east branch to celebrate the work that had taken place on the river corridor over the last decade. Taking to the river to paddle over six miles out and back from Portage Lakefront and Riverwalk. In the fall, we rolled up our sleeves to help the National Park remove invasive autumn olive from the Tolston Dunes in Gary as part of a collaborative grant we are administrating. What a year for community engagement. We continue to expand community engagement into Lake County through our Hydroflask Parks for All programming in collaboration with Brown Faces Green Spaces at the gorgeous Marquette Park in Gary. Later that summer, we celebrated National S'mores Day with the Indiana Dunes State Park and Smokey the Bear. Our new Barker Seasonal Forum debuted. This programming aims to share Save the Dunes mission across sectors of conservation, advocacy, community engagement, and history. September marked our new venture into advanced recycling with a recycled bench project in collaboration with Nextrex. Our goal to keep a thousand pounds of plastic out of nature and landfills will be rewarded with a recycled plastic bench in honor of past Save the Dunes president, Jeanette Nagu. Autumn was here before we knew it. Come October, we hosted Campfire Tales and S'mores event at the Barker House where we shared the haunted history of the Indiana Dunes region and welcomed community members to share their ghost stories around a fire. 
Art came into focus in November for an artist talk and woodcut demonstration at the Barker House with regional artist Corey Hagelberg, who created our 70th anniversary poster. 2023 was another amazing year for Save the Dunes, but we couldn't have done it alone. Membership makes all the difference supporting our mission, so thank you to our members, corporate partners, and board as you all truly make up the network of amazing people who make our work at Save the Dunes possible. Okay. I haven't watched that in a while. I forgot how cute it is. <laughs> All right. Um, so back to our presentation. Hopefully that video gives you a little bit of an idea about the types of projects um, we have worked on in the past. So now we'd like to share a little bit about the how and why behind our current program work, along with some of our most anticipated projects for the coming year. So to start off, we'll look at our conservation work, um, protecting and restoring the lands and waters that make up the dunes ecosystems is at the core of our work. And even though we have a national park and a state park and many other nature preserves and county or city parks in our region, the fight to save the dunes is certainly not over. Now, this is because there are innumerable threats that our natural areas face from invasive species to climate change and development pressures all leading to biodiversity loss and the fact that our region is so incredibly fragmented just exacerbates all of these issues and makes conservation in northwest indiana very complicated and at times very challenging and of course there are many more threats that are not listed here unfortunately um so here are some of the ways that we go about addressing those threats now, to start off, we are still primarily focused on the land and water surrounding the Indiana Dunes National and State Parks, but more broadly, our focus area includes Lake, Porter, and LaPorte counties. In this region, we prioritize working in partnership with other organizations to not only increase communication and collaboration, but also to achieve landscape level conservation whenever possible. For decades, Save the Dunes has been a leader in bringing together different environmental organizations, government agencies, businesses, and individuals to take collective action. Another role we play in um, with our partners um, in conservation is that of grant administrator. We frequently apply for grants and include our partners in the budget so that they can focus on the on the ground restoration work and we take care of the reports and paperwork. So just to give you an idea in 2023 last year, we um, gave over $300,000 to our partners for conservation work across Northwest Indiana. We also focus a lot on public education to try and expand the network of conservationists in the dunes. So you don't have to work for the National Park or an environmental nonprofit to protect and restore the environment. So we try to provide free resources and events to inspire others to take action. And finally, Save the Dunes owns 11 properties. And over the past year, we have increased our stewardship of those properties. In fact, the project I am most excited for um, in 2024 involves expanding those effort, efforts even further. So last year we began invasive species management at our Stockwell Woods property in Long Beach. There are a few pictures on the left here of that property. Um, we'll be continuing that work in 2024. But we're also seeking funding to remove invasive species at our Trail Creek Fen property in Michigan City, which are the photos on the right. It is such a beautiful property. Um, we made a couple of site visits at the end of, of last year and I fell in love. <laughs> and it's so rewarding to visit these special places and know that we are investing in their long term health and protection. So I am finally going to stop talking now and I'm going to turn it over to Harshini to walk us through our advocacy work. Thank you so much, Katie. Um... So hi everyone, I'm Harshini, I'm the Advocacy Coordinator. I've been with Save the Dunes for about one and a half years. I'm gonna talk briefly about our currently our current advocacy efforts and ways that you can become a local advocate as well. Um, so our organization has always been rooted in advocacy, as Katie said, since it really began. Uh, so supporters such as our Save the Dunes founder, Dorothy Buell, rallied public support and were really instrumental in the effort to establish the National Park 
um, in the Indiana Dunes region. And without her effort and the effort of many other key lawmakers and advocates at that time, it's very likely there would not be a national park to this day in our area and other protected dune areas. So this is really important. Um, following in her footsteps, our efforts for local advocacy have not really slowed down. They've just changed a little bit. Um, so today we address many of the threats to our local environment, including shoreline erosion, invasive species management, water pollution prevention, um, development pressures, and even the public's right to access the beach. And we take a very evidence-based approach to our advocacy efforts and focus a lot on nonpartisan Great Lakes issues across Northwest Indiana, so specifically focusing more on water policy. So, for example, we engage with industries with a focus on best practices on their various activities, but also we communicate with our regulatory bodies and our regulatory agencies, such as the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, regularly to create a culture of pollution and prevention across the Northwest Indiana region. So next, I want to bring up a specific example of our advocacy efforts. So I just want to talk about Great Lakes Day a little bit, where we travel to D.C. Uh, once a year with a team uh, from Indiana for in-person meetings with our Indiana congressional leadership. And we show our support for bipartisan federal Great Lakes issues, such as uh, funding the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, uh, tackling invasive species issues, et cetera. And this is one of the most effective ways that we advocate for the Indiana Dunes, because we are able to meet with the people who represent us in person with the congressional members and their staffers um, who represent all of us and discuss the important water policy issues that are concerning for us and uh, for our community members in our region. So uh, next, I just want to talk about the how and why of advocacy. So how or why rather do we do advocacy? So uh, we do advocacy because our voices matter. Being a citizen of Northwest Indiana is great and important and using your own advocacy voice to influence other important issues that affect you and the environment and the community that you live in is really essential. Um, as many as you know, uh, Northwest Indiana is one of the most biodiverse and unique regions in the entire United States. We are uh, in a very different position because our natural spaces are near such heavy industrial presence. So that means that our ecosystems are affected in different ways um, from other places in the United States and face very different challenges. And only the community members who live, work, and recreate in our region really understand that un and understand the complexities of that and understand also how precious it is and how complex and complicated it is to live here. Um, so how exactly should you advocate in our region? So uh, one of the best examples to do this and easiest examples is to just advocate by going online, um, by simply commenting on rule changes from the government during public comment periods. That's one of the most effective and easy ways to do this. Um, it's also a great way to voice your own opinion and also make sure that your community voice is being counted in these really important decisions. So I'm just gonna give a couple of examples of upcoming advocacy calls to action. So uh, the Indiana State session starts in January, in a couple of days actually. Uh, so wetland regulation at both the state and federal levels is something that we're focused on and we're going to be researching. So due to the Supreme Court case, Sackett versus EPA, uh, which significantly reduced the federal wetland protection, the remaining wetlands are now up to the state. Uh, unfortunately, Indiana law is uh, currently not great when it comes to this. It leaves most of the wetlands in our state unprotected. So starting to reach out to your local state representatives and expressing your concern for wetlands would be a great place to start. Um, another example is to be supporting the uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So this is bipartisan legislation that will ensure that the fish and, fish and wildlife managers have the resources that they need to implement proactive conservation projects um, and also help to prevent species from becoming endangered and being on the endangered species list in the first place. Uh, another example is you could ask your uh, federal congressman to pass the Monarch Action Recovery and Conservation of Habitat Act to restore critical habitats to our indispensable native pollinators, such as the monarch butterfly. Um, there are always other ways to advocate. These are not the only examples. And the easiest way to do this and to advocate for things that you believe in is to follow Indiana environmental nonprofits, such as, of course, our organization, but also others that we work with a lot, such as Hoosier Environmental Council, you know, Shirley Hines, et cetera. If you're interested in a particular advocacy topic, I encourage you to really do your own research and consider doing it, you know, yourself, perhaps joining or forming your own advocacy group uh, or working for a local nonprofit 
nonprofit. Uh, whatever your interest is, uh, if both informing yourself and also others or your community around you is the best way to start on your advocacy journey. So last, I just want to discuss one of the advocacy projects that I'm really excited for in 2024, uh, which is the Coastal Resiliency Project. Uh, we recently received a Lake Michigan Coastal Program grant that focuses on coastal resiliency education for the Northwest Indiana general public. So we're going to discuss several topics related to coastal resiliency and then relay that information that is important and unique to the Indiana Dunes region through public facing fact sheets. So these fact sheets are going to be shared digitally and in person at our uh, tabling events. And the topics will include important issues such as recreating responsibly, wetland regulations, shoreline erosion, et cetera. Uh, we're currently in the brainstorming segment of this project, but we're really excited to share this important information with our communities um, in a way that's both informative, easy to understand, and also will empower the community members to be an advocate themselves. And now I'm going to pass it over to M, our community engagement coordinator. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm having the worst time with my computer today. Um, my name is M. Racine. I joined Save the Dunes last June as their community engagement coordinator. As a lifelong visitor and now resident of the dunes, this question of how and why the dunes still need saving has never been more top of my mind and I think should be at the top of our community's minds. Before we get into the ways in which community engagement answers this question, I'd like to offer some more specifics on what community engagement is and how that looks for Save the Dunes. So community engagement is generally a public participation, including events, opinions, and ideas, which can influence decisions that affect the planning and provision of services, future visions, and the sustainability of our communities. Save the Dunes prioritizes working with and listening to the communities of Lake, Porter, and LaPorte County to build long-term relationships and develop meaningful solutions to complex issues. By deepening these relationships, ideally, we are promoting the value of the community input, inclusivity, and diversity through the dunes. So here at Save the Dunes, community engagement happens through, oh, sorry, can you go back, Karshini? Um, happens through creating and sharing educational resources, such as our fact sheets and our coastal living guides, which uplift through knowledge and information freely available to our communities. Through social media, the best place to keep in touch with our work, find out how to get involved, see what the happenings are. It has most of our social medias host all of that information. Uh, events, by engaging and curating intentional events, we make sure the efforts and outcomes of the events are in alignment with our mission. Through volunteerism, which gives folks a sense of ownership and participation in the natural areas, and volunteer days are often a great time to find yourself amongst like-minded people, and that's community. And then finally, through partnership. Other nonprofits and local organizations, much like Harshini mentioned, supporting those organizations in this area um, help us band together to create a support system in which the community can rely on. Many voices are much often louder than a single shout. So on to the how and why. Save the Dunes main methods of engagement include events and partnerships, as well as intentional educational and informational shares on social media platforms, also known as digital first engagement. We know that we can reach a variety of audiences through sharing updates, history, and our events through digital channels, and that online engagement is often the most accessible to folks. You can really make a big difference by reposting our infographics or sharing a digital copy of our pollinator guide with a neighbor. You know what they say, knowledge is power. Another way that the Save the Dunes uplifts through community engagement is face-to-face -face or in-person events, where Save the Dunes always centers listening and collaboration with community members, because we believe that the folks who live and work in Northwest Indiana share their concerns through the lens of wanting to stay informed and to participate in creating active and positive change. 
We coordinate corporate volunteer days with local businesses and sponsors that help better integrate nature-based life and work balance. As we know that spending time in nature is proven to lessen stress and give a better quality of life. So we're always encouraged community members to enjoy the beauty of the dunes by creating accessible and educational access to them. And, and that's and inviting community to get involved and make a difference, yep. I am now gonna talk about a little project that I'm really excited about. Um, I am really excited about embarking on this new community garden project on the Barker House grounds. We'll be focusing on creating a native pollinator garden following the outlines suggested in our guide. So it's really just like putting our you know energy into the next step. We made this pollinator guide in 2022 and it has a really comprehensive and beautiful guide and we're going to use it to create a new community garden right at save the dunes headquarters um, we have several community volunteer days planned for that which will give folks an opportunity to both learn and participate in the creation of this space so here are some ongoing and upcoming community engagement opportunities this is when people really get to make a difference they really get to come out tell us you know, how and why they appreciate the dunes and why they want them to stay around and learn while they're at it. Um, so as always, we have green drinks, which happens regularly monthly on the first Thursdays, and that covers a variety of environmental topics that affect this area. Um, we also have our Barker Seasonal Forum coming up, which we will cover history, which as Katie mentioned, if you are a history buff, Save the Dunes and this area are, you know, rich with history. So we'll cover that with the Westchester Township um, History Museum curator, Serena Ard, on February 28th. And then we have our community garden days that I mentioned. Those will be volunteer days on Saturdays for a couple of hours, um, ranging in different things that we'll be working on. So those are some dates for those. Um, a big opportunity coming up is to travel to Great Lakes Day with us for Save the Dunes. If you want to get, you know, fully immersed in the advocacy for this area, this is an amazing time. If you really feel like you have a voice to be shared, we would love to uplift you and invite you to apply to our to travel with us. So I'll be leaving that link in the chat and on Facebook. So if anyone would like to apply for that, we can find the link there. And then um, our ongoing community recycling project, which was mentioned in the video and will be ongoing. We are collecting plastic bags and films at three different locations in, across the uh, Porter and LaPorte County. And that is going to be rewarded with a bench, which will then be in our pollinator garden. So it's really about keeping community involved to see how they can, you know, see things through and get involved and actually see the differences that they're making. And we want as Save the Dunes to uplift you in doing so. Um, last slide is just thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. This mission is really special and has such great history. Um, the best way to keep up to date with what's going on with us, like I mentioned, is following us on social. So we're on Instagram at Save the Dunes. You can find us on Facebook by just searching Save the Dunes. And then, of course, signing up for our newsletter. That's right in your inbox updates, information, what's going on, how to get involved. So thank you guys. Nancy, you're still muted. <laughs> I wasn't saying anything. Oh, you I'm weren't? I thought you were. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we this don't have to this, this is the time we're actually transitioning into questions that people may have dropped in the chat um, oh. here on Zoom, or if there are any uh, questions in the comments on Facebook. And I'm going to let you all handle that if that's okay. Yeah, so, so far we've, I've only seen one question in, um, on Facebook, which is how many members are in Save the Dunes and is that number growing? So, I do have that number and right now we're at 370 members and I know I don't know the statistical growth number but I know that that's a pretty robust number for us to have for members right now so that means that you guys care about it and you're supporting our mission to continue to do what we're doing. 
And if I can add a quick shout out to Lisa Scheller, our de development manager, I know she's watching on Facebook Live. She joined us last summer and has just been doing a fantastic job of increasing our donors and our members. And so I think a lot of that is, is due to her very hard work. But yeah, that's, I know it was a dramatic increase last year. So things are going well. <laughs> right. Um, and if I could just add membership, I think was around 200 when I took over the presidency. And that was a couple of years ago. So you can see that is um, really significant growth in the number of members we have. So um, thank you so much, um, Save the Dunes team. Um, okay. Um, there's one. I think that's all the questions that I see. Yeah, um, so I don't I have a couple of other announcements that you would you like me to move into my announcements. Um, what I would like to do first is to talk about our action item. Um, for for this for this uh, for the month, and um, this is something we've been doing regularly um, at um, Northwest Indiana Green Drinks, and we're gonna pick it up and institute it again. Somehow, it lost its way in our agenda. So, um, the wetlands are gonna be extremely important in this upcoming Indiana legislative session, as Harshini mentioned in her presentation. So, I want to bring to your attention um, an action that's going on right now. And this was pulled together with a partner called the Indiana Land Protection Alliance. They go by AILPA. And they have posted a number of wetlands um, on their website. And their website is actually www.protectindianaland.org. That's www.protectindianaland.org. And they picked out a number of wetlands around Indiana, and they put up these really special spiffy signs. And it's like a picture frame, and you and your friends and family can get in there and click your pick and um, go ahead and post it on social media. And if you don't do social media, then they're asking you to send it to them as an attachment and an email. And what they're going to be doing is they're going to be collecting all of these and using them um, as um, our um, representatives from our various nonprofits go to speak to our legislators at the state capitol and show them that the wetlands are important to us and why they are important. If you don't have one of these places near you, then please go ahead and snap a pic of your favorite wetlands with you in it, and they'll be able to include that also. So this is something everybody can do, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you go to the um, Save the Dunes Facebook page, they've posted theirs already, um, so you can have a look and be inspired to become part of this movement. Indiana, I will just declare, is the worst state when it comes to protecting our wetlands, because basically we are not protecting them. So that's the message that I really want to deliver to you today as president of Save the Dunes. I know Harshini was being very polite about it, but we are at the bottom of the pile when it comes to states and our concern for and our protection of our wetlands. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so announcements now. And um, okay. it's going to make a couple. And if anybody that's on here has an announcement, you can drop it in the chat or you can ask to make the announcement yourself. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Um, the couple of announcements that we have are our next green drinks, which will be happening on the first Thursday in February. And that will be with the Hoosier Environmental Council Senior Policy and Legal Director David Van Gilder will be presenting. So I'm sure they'll have tons of information on how, as an Indiana resident, you can really hit the ground running this month or this year or whenever you can to get involved. Um, I think this is a really important year to do that. So let's keep, you know, keep staying engaged. And then um, the other event outside of Save the Dunes happenings are the National Park Service is debuting a new program called Science Fridays, which will be starting next week. I'll drop the link again in the chat for you guys, um, but definitely another great way to get involved and learn about the region and keep expanding your involvement across all of the different environmental sectors if that's your, you know, your bag, which it probably is if you're here at Green Drinks with us. So. <laughs>
Um, and then of course I already went over all of my events, but please, I dropped some other links in the, in the chat here, the wetlands challenge link is here in the chat. So feel free to get that. The link for the application to great Lakes stay with us is open and on that chat as well. Um, and feel free to share any of these videos with your network, any of these updates with your network. If you've heard something and you think you know someone who would love to get involved, Send them our way. We want them over here. <laughs> okay. I think that's that's it on, on my, from, from me. <laughs> okay. Uh, is anybody uh, on the Zoom with us right now that would uh, have an event that they would like to share with the group? Something about green, of course. Okay, then I, I just want to thank everybody so very much for attending this evening and especially heartfelt thanks to the Save the Dunes team. Um, I call you our dream team. And that does include um, Betsy Mayer, our executive director. Um, we finally are fully staffed um, for the first time in a long while. And it just feels so good to know that all of our programmatic areas are being covered by people who are not experts in and extremely knowledgeable knowledgeable about their area, but they are so passionate about what they do. And they have fun doing it. I go into the office and it's a happy place and it's a productive place. And it's a place where things really are happening and they are making a difference. So I just want to give all of them an applause from all of us that are online to let them know how much we appreciate their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's a wrap until we see you in February. And please join us then and let a lot of people know about this because we truly can make a difference in our state capital by being in communication and establishing relationships with our elected officials. Thank you. <laughs>